You think we should get started? We can begin. All right. Everybody who's here. Um, so far, people may be coming in over the next few minutes, so try not to uh, be too distracted by that. I want to take a minute to welcome everyone here to Trink Talks. Um, it's, a, uh, it's great to see a number of familiar faces and a number of not so familiar faces. A uh, quick word before we get started on procedure. We've muted all of the audience members to minimize background noise, dogs barking, cats meowing, chickens <laughs> crowing, and so forth. Um, but we encourage you to participate, please, by posting your questions and comments in the chat section, and we'll do our very best to save the last 10 to 15 minutes for those, um, for those questions, for those people who have them. Um, I also want to say a thank you to our web and our logo designers and the entire team at Median and Genten in Bad Durkheim, Germany for, for their incredible work in putting together the one pager on Trink the magazine and on um, getting a link where you can move directly from the website into this chat room. Um, my name is Paula Rita Sidor. Some of you may know me as Vine Story on the German side, some of you may not. Uh, I'm an American, as you can hear, wine writer and translator, originally from New Hampshire and living in Germany since 2002. Uh, I came over to Berlin thinking petrol was something that I put in my car, not the aroma <laughs> of Abe Driesling. <laughs> uh, only, only to find that my very first German course was in a room full of winemakers' sons and daughters, and I had some serious catching up to do and it was what you might call trial by reasoning. So thankfully, <laughs> hopefully, I've learned a bit since then, including a bit of German. And the first word that I learned was Trink. Trink is the German word for drink. It's also a new publication coming later this summer that aims at nothing less than changing the conversation about German-speaking wine, building bridges between the people making the wines and the people who are drinking them. We're going to be having on the ground reporting from journalists, narrative essays, features, photography, interviews, bottle picks, um, hoping to communicate the heart and the history of Germany, Austria, and Südtirol, one region and one story at a time. If you'd like to know more, please, we encourage you to drop your email into the private chat to us so that we can keep you informed as things progress. And now I will turn over the um, screen, I guess the microphone, the screen, to my co-moderator, Valerie Katawala. Hello, I am Valerie, based in New York, also a writer focused on the wines of Germany, Austria, and Altuadige, and a lifelong student of these cultures and histories. Uh, I am also a runner, and most of my best, if sometimes my brashest ideas, come to me while logging my daily miles. A few weeks ago, thinking about this series of conversations, the question came to me, with German wine more thrilling than ever before, why is it so hard to convince consumers of this? In short, what is the grudge against German wine? What are the prejudices, the misperceptions, and why do we always tiptoe around them, pretending they're not there? An honest, contextualized discussion felt and feels well overdue. And in that moment, I knew the people I would want to discuss this with, would be Eric, Anne, and Paula. So the fact that we're all here today truly is a dream come true. Uh, our guests today are Anne Prebel, a master of wine and widely published freelance writer, speaker, educator, contributing editor at Wine Enthusiast, and most critically for our purposes, author of The Wines of Germany, which was published late last year. If you haven't read it yet, I can say it is the book I turn to for my own work, and it is accessible, deeply informative, sharply written, and framed many of the questions we'll be addressing today. Our second guest is Eric Asimov, the New York Times chief wine critic since 2004, author of How to Love Wine, and just last week generated what we might consider a virtual standing ovation for his article urging consumers to give Riesling a fair shake, seven out of his 10 selections coming from Germany, I might add. While many of his peers have politely ignored German wines, Eric has long written passionately, critically, and thoughtfully about them. So Eric, let's dig right in with you with our first most freighted question. <clears throat> um, an argument can be made that the perception of German wine mirrors the perception of Germany as a nation. 
Germany was late to unify and establish a national identity until it assumed a disastrous one, not once, but twice in the 20th century. Stuart Pickett, who's on the call with us today, has said that for a long time, there was an unwillingness to see belong the, beyond the long shadow of 1933 to 1945, quote, Americans, including some New York Times readers, are way behind on what is happening in Germany and only recently started catching up, end quote. Eric, how do you think this plays out in German wine? Well, uh, first let me say how happy I am to be here and how happy I am to see uh, some very familiar faces in the, in the audience. Um, I doubt that that really plays a role anymore maybe with our parents or our grandparents' generations who, who came out of that war period with uh, deeply held prejudice against German products. But I mean, look at the, the cars that, that people aspire to owning in this country. I mean, you know, if we can, if, if we can um, uh, be happy about owning a BMW, how can we not be happy about drinking some of the greatest wines in the world? Um, I, I certainly don't think the pre-20th century of uh, history of Germany plays any role in, in people's buying decisions. And I think today, um, especially uh, given the uh, events of the last four years or so, uh, Germany has probably never been more respected around the globe and certainly in the United States than, uh, than it is now. Okay. It's, it's interesting you bring up cars um, because that's certainly something that I've spent some time thinking about. You're, you're right that the German mechanical cars automotive um, prowess is, is certainly completely respected but it feels like people have sort of lost the, the romance of the wines. Like they, they look at these wines as, as perfectly constructed examples, but that's not necessarily, but that, that lacks some of the charm and the romance that people are looking for when they reach for a bottle, or do you not see that so much? Um, no, I don't, I don't think that's so much the issue. I think um, really, the problem is a lack of familiarity and a lack of understanding and, and some deeply held misunderstandings about um, German wine and Riesling in general. I mean, um, we know here that, that Germany makes a lot of different wines beyond Riesling, but it's really Riesling that people associate with Germany. And in the United States, no matter how many times you, you discuss Riesling, the, there's a prevailing belief that it's all sweet and that sweet wine is something that, that people don't like. Mm, okay. Don't, don't you think that uh, boils down to people thinking it's wine for pussies? Uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't I mean, say macho that. Guys, yeah. I would think macho guys in the USA are very much going to think that a wine which is sweet and light is a wine for pussies. No. Um, I mean, macho guys probably <laughs> don't drink white wine in general. Or yeah, sure. Wine. But if they were going but, to drink, right, wouldn't they, wouldn't they want to drink something as heavy and, and bulky and massive and muscular as possible. They um, I, I have counted that a thousand times. <laughs> what was that, Anne? I don't, I don't uh, necessarily agree. I don't think that it's a, it's a problem of, um, of self-image in terms of the audience. I think it's a problem of, of ignorance. And I think that, um, you know, there are a lot of other issues with, uh, with German wine beyond what, what I've mentioned and some of which we will get to today. Yeah, I have to say, you know, we talked about the cars. Well, to me, uh, that was something very striking when, when I lived in New York City from fall 12 to fall 16. Uh, on the television, the what, where and how was Germany most visible? 
well, it was the BMW ads, and they, they said, the ultimate driving machine. <laughs> well, would you, would you associate with a country that produced the ultimate driving machine, would you associate a wine that was uh, joyful and playful well, and um, um, a, a wonderful wine just to share with your friends tonight on the patio? I'm not sure. Well, I don't, I don't think that uh, countries are defined by uh, product commercials. Um, just getting back to your earlier point, um, I mean, you've seen the, the rising popularity of rosé around the world. And if macho guys are drinking pink wine, they can drink Riesling, even... even uh, I, do, you know, I, do, more, I don't think the rosé thing. But really, the problem is the association, not the association with, of sweetness with, um, with, with, with uh, estrogen or whatever. <laughs> it's really, it's the association of sweetness with bad wine. And, and the ignorance about wine that leads one to think that if one likes sweet wine, it, it indicates a, a, a fallibility in their sense of taste. Mm -hmm. um, and I had one question for you. Thank you, Eric. Um, you have Terry Teese, speaking of sweet wine and sort of looking at the, at the historical the way that the German wine has sort of taken shape in the, in the US and Terry Teese obviously was, was a major proponent in that and his, he had a leaning towards sweet wine. Um, but what he kept talking about was a lack of, or a failure of people to connect with the sensual life of the country. And one of the things that sort of got me thinking about, about it is that you have France which has a year in Provence and everybody was storming Provence after that. And you have Italy, which has under the Tuscan sun, and suddenly everybody wanted to go to Italy and gain that experience beyond just the wine. They wanted to gain that experience. Germany has Rumpelstiltskin. Not exactly gonna be a huge storm towards Germany for that. And you, you are German, you love Germany, and you love German wines, and you've, you've made a career talking about that. What do you see that so many people seem to be missing? It seems that there's this stumbling block, and I'd love to open up and see what you see as that as the stumbling block for people. Well, um, first of all, hello, and zum wohl, everyone. It's um, quarter past eight here in London, so I am allowed a drink, and I'm drinking Sekt because I love bubbles, and it is a 2012 extra brut dry bone dry Riesling sect um, from 2012, which is as fresh as a daisy. Um, so, salute. Salute. Mm. Mm. And just this in itself makes me think that Mr. Klaus Harris, who makes this, has a vineyard that he goes to harvest in his boat because it's the only way he can get there. And um, with Stuart, I share, I mean, Stuart and I are counterparts to a degree, because it's the Englishman who lives in Germany. I'm the German woman who lives in the UK. And um, so I am very, very familiar with the kind of view non-Germans have of Germany. And um, I also always think about the cars. And um, the slogan I think of is not of BMW, it is of Audi, which even here in the UK uses this German phrase, Vorsprung durch Technik. I don't know whether you know that in the States at all. And then sometimes some bloke says it in a terribly English accent thing, Vorsprung durch Technik, and it just sort of hurts my ears. But um, there are things here in the UK that people associate with Germany. Those are cars and high-performing cars. Those are Miele and Bosch washing machines that work and um, that perform. There, are, uh, there is a huge following for the Bundesliga, the, the German soccer game, which is um, kind of, I don't know, all a different world to me and all Greek to me. But people, if they have associations with Germany, it's also about the Autobahn and the fast cars and the efficiency. 
and um, a certain kind of a certain kind of sobriety, directness, uncouthness, if, if this slips into the negative. But certainly what I associate with Germany, um, there is a lack of knowing that Germany can be a sensuous country. And to me, I, to me, it is just, you know, if you ask me about Germany, I think of I am from Baden, the south, the Black Forest. So to me, it is this deep forest and the cold, cold lakes in which I love to swim. It is to me also a summer's day in the Pfalz where I stop my car because I'm driving past an orchard so laden with fruit that I just stopped and gorged myself on Mirabelle plums. And, you know, and or being in Didesheim and almost falling into the fountain because I want to wash some fruit that I've bought. And um, an Australian friend of mine went to Germany, was invited to a wedding and came back and said, oh my God, um, they have lifestyle in Germany. They have cafes on the street. I was like, yes, we know how to live. We do, we do, you know? And um, I also, being from Baden, I have to tell you that the density of Michelin star restaurants down south is higher than anywhere else in the world. Is it really? I didn't even know that. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you. And that, that is what needs to be out there much and more. you know the kind of, the, the rivers, the meadows, the forests, the, those gorgeous vineyards where these things grow. But, you know, we know that and for us this is a reality and therefore it's hard possibly for us to make that leap for the people who've not been there and i must also we must also be very honest and frank we go to provine wine fair in march landing in Dusseldorf in march or in berlin in january or february is so grim you know hello <laughs> i've seen lots of people that i know so you know there is a difficulty. <laughs> Hello, Ralph. <laughs> um, there is a difficulty for those people who have not had the advantage of being immersed in this beauty to, to be able to appreciate what we're talking about, because we all know that this beauty absolutely does exist. And so there is no, for us, no question at all, but perhaps it's down to us as writers and communicators to convey that more. And there's one further point, which also speaks to the development of what has happened in Germany. I don't know if you guys know Tom Labe from uh, Dumin Matassa in the Roussillon in Cal. He once very interestingly said that there was too much Geisenheim in a lot of wine. That is a long time ago since he said that, but I thought it was perceptive. And I think that this has finally stopped being the case. Yeehaw. Can you explain that, Anne, just for people who might oh, have um, Geisenheim is Germany's foremost viticultural and enological college. And um, they also do lots of courses on drinks technology. And we know that in the 20th century, um, in the second half of the 20th century, um, Germany became a country of engineers and technocrats. And they really, really, really believed. So here we are the, talking about the white man, you know, the white males who have something to say in this world and sadly still do. Um, so they learned their engineering, they had their engineering degrees, they learned how to dominate nature, they thought they could do it all. They, they really thought this is what we have to do, these are the parameters. This is what we can do. And so, of course, if the, if the German winemaking elite passes through this school, um, and then they make wines that way, which are sort of technically faultless, but a little bit soulless, then that is also a problem because what we, and it, it totally fits in with a Bosch washing machine, and it fits in with uh, the fast car and the, the driving machine, or what I can't remember, but the, the, the driving machine that is the BMW is like, yeah, this is um, fine tuned, super engineered, you know, um, kind of 
modern modernist um, technological winemaking on a on a on a twenty first century scale. Well, no, it's only now that people are not now, but over the past twenty years or so, have sort of turned their back and have really looked at their soil, at their vineyards, at their landscapes. Right now, people are redefining what Germany is. And I think that to me is the most beautiful thing because it means they're doing everything with their heart and with their senses. Yes, and, and this is, this been, you're quite right. And this has been going on for quite a few years. And the dis depressing thing is how little interest there is in that um, in the whole outside world. Um, if those wines, the most exciting new wines of Germany, were in were from Burgundy, they would have long since received massive recognition and be uh, almost impossible to buy and horribly expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is the clearest, to me, the clearest proof that there there are things at work which don't have directly to do with the wine, mm -hmm. um, because otherwise they would have achieved that success. And if we are talking, if we're talking about it, would have been... Sorry, please go ahead. I think we can stipulate that point that the, the wines are eminently worthy of being discovered and embraced. And I very much take um, Terry's point and, and Anne's point about uh, Americans not being familiar with the uh, sensual side of Germany. And one of the major reasons for that is because we, we lack the perhaps the, the greatest export that would would help Americans get to know that side of Germany and that that is restaurants. And if Southern Germany does have the the greatest concentration of Michelin star restaurants in the world, we really need some of those restaurants because the the very few German restaurants that you will find in New York are, are simple Rathskeller or, you know, old fashioned umpa kind of Black places Swan. that specialize in beer. And, you know, that's very much a, a, a delightful thing, but um, we, we need the sort of restaurants that will show German wine to its best advantage with food that, that, it flatters, and I, I, you know, none of us know what the what the future of restaurants are right now. So it's a very difficult discussion to have. But there, there simply isn't that sort of exposure in the United States for for German food and wine culture, and therefore, people's ideas are are vastly out of date. I so agree. This is such a central point. And um, I, but I also want to make another point because there is something, I don't want German wines only to be seen as fancy schmancy um, uh, because I was just talking about the Pfalz and one of the greatest joys for me is a Leberwurst brought with a glass of Riesling. And this is so down to earth and so, so rustic. Um, and Riesling goes with it. And can we say, everybody appreciates Germany for its beer. This is a story that has traveled well. And that is absolutely where people are convinced and where there is lots of authenticity that has been taken there. And the craft beer movement ma made it even stronger. And so um, I think it is something to do where Anglo-Saxon cultures struggle with wine as an elitist concept, whereas beer never struggled with an elitist concept. Absolutely. So you have an elitist concept plus a weird country that you haven't got a handle on, essentially. Whereas, you know, every trattoria might have had a horrendous fiasco of, of Chianti when when Chianti was still made with a percentage of Trebbiano, God forbid, you know, and I am a great, a great admirer and lover of Sangiovese and great Chianti Grassico, but it wasn't always thus, you know. 
And so, but every trattoria, every pizzeria had, you know, its its red wine. Every French bistro had its, you know, every Spanish this tapas bar has has its Spanish wines, and there simply isn't an equivalent um, for German um, wines. And I only wish that the beer halls would would have a sect night with, you know. Forelle Blau and Forelle is trout. Um, so, you know, and, and do something that is approachable and delicious and, and takes, you know, that is first and foremost about pleasure and then about everything else because this is how we open our hearts to things, you know? That was one of my favorite things that I learned in Germany. It was a gute bürgerliche Küche. It was more like mama's, mama's cooking but in German, and it was the same sort of straightforward, wonderful meals that satiate you, that have no fuss, but are delicious. What, what, what grows together goes together. And that's, um, that's the, those are the sides of Germany that have somehow been missed in the, in the export. Those are the things that you only get here. And that's, I think when we can manage to find a way to export some of those, that side of Germany. Um, hopefully the wine will follow along with it. Where you have an entry point in the U.S. and in, in the cities in particular is in the natural wine culture. Mm -hmm. um, I think the um, consumers of natural wine are far less beholden to um, images of the past and far more open to, to different expressions. And... Um, I know that uh, the natural wine um, culture of Germany is probably a lot more robust than most people imagine outside of Germany. And it would be nice to see, see that sort of, of infiltration into the American wine market. Absolutely, I have to say having been to Raw Wine New York last fall and looked at the endless table of Austrian producers and then the three person table of German producers right next to it can only send one message that Germany doesn't do this or Germany doesn't care. And that seems to be so off point. Germany is just, as you say, Eric, brimming with natural producers. It's some of the most, some of the most dynamic work is really coming out of there right now, but it doesn't translate. And when you speak with German producers, they're shocked that that message isn't clear in the U.S. And um, just, just to clarify one thing on the restaurant subject, um, I don't think we need uh, me, more Michelin star restaurants in New York or in the U.S. because really that's not the way people want to eat anymore. Mm. We are... Um, Unless, unless the pendulum swings again, uh, people are far more interested in casual dining and, and um, uh, very relaxed um, circumstances and, uh, and menus. But um, there still would be a, gr a great uh, opportunity for German restaurants, the equivalent of, um, of, of bistro, uh, bistronomy, Mm -hmm. uh, the German equipment of bistronomy in, in the U.S. Um, that could really help to expose the, the great range of, of German wines, not just great, you know, Grand Cru style Rieslings, but, um, but really the whole spectrum of wines. Exactly. And you know, you, you say that, and all I can think is Maultaschen with Trollinger, um, but then I'm outing myself as a southerner. I <laughs> truly do know how to live and how to cook. I, I grew up watching my mom and my grandma, you know, um, cutting the cutting the spätzle into the salt water. This is and Kässpätzle is basically a very, very rustic version of macaroni cheese, but utterly delicious. And you know, like so, yes, perhaps, perhaps um, you know, there is, the, as we say, there is an incredibly sensuous side to Germany, 
and that needs to be translated truly it, 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 because it is yeah it's just delish and you know we should make it easy for people and um just put something delicious in front of them and and you know yourself um that actually takes us nicely to the next question that I would ask of both of you. How important do you think it is that we maybe pull away from looking at German wine as German wine and focus more on the regions and communicate their individual identities? I mean, um, and you're just speaking about the, the distinctive culture of the South, of Baden and the Württemberg. And if we did less of what we um, if we did more of what we do for Italy and France and Spain, and we talked about the regional identities and those food connections, cultural connections, would that be more effective? Could we reach more people that way? I, I don't know, but you have touched upon a very interesting point. And um, I also must now take a bit of an excursion, but so I was asked to write a book about German wine, and then I went and wrote it. But I think I, there, was, there was times when I thought it was so bloody unfair to ask me to do that in 100,000 words. Because in France, people got to write about, oh, somebody wrote about the Côte d'Or. Somebody in the same series, okay? Somebody wrote a book just about Chablis. Somebody wrote a book about, I don't know, Champagne. And you know, like, and, Every single one of us who goes to any kind of formal wine education, they, we will start with Bordeaux. Then we shall move on to Burgundy. Then we move on to the Loire. And then we move to Champagne. And then, you know, the south of France is sort of lumped together, along with Roussillon and the Midi and the Rhone. And if you're lucky, you get a bit of Alsace. And then you move on to Italy, and it's Tuscany and Piedmont, and the south, and perhaps the islands. And then if you're lucky at all, Germany and Austria get lumped in together, and this is a kind of indoctrination. And this is indoctrination by wine education. And, you know, this is, Germany covers four degrees of latitude, has 13 regions, and nobody, nobody, unless they have really, really spent time in order to refine their knowledge, which you can't ask a busy person to do who's running a SOM shift and, 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 you know, managing a list that contains the wines of the world. So there is, indo there is an indoctrination problem with the way wine is taught and that all of Germany is always lumped together. And, um, and so you have this, this cultural hodgepodge because we have such strong regional identities and if you just look at Riesling how different it is from the Mosel from that in Baden from that in Saxony um, and but this is all just this is all just detail you know this is just detail and too fine a detail in the wine in in the world we we still move in and I think that this kind of wine education indoctrination is a little bit at fault because it gives people a hierarchy um, in terms, not in terms of price, but in terms of thinking and in terms of time spent evaluating. And, you know, again, how can you blame people? How can you blame people for not knowing or selling better or communicating better if they're not even taught? Yeah. So that's, that, that, and I think that, that, that also plays a huge role. And Germany is always lumped together as this big, as this big block of stuff with weird umlauts, too many consonants, and ah, I don't know it anyway, so let's move on to the next thing. But you know, and, it's, sorry. it's restricted to, to Germany, um, but it points to the ignorance that, that people have uh, uh, of German culture in the United States. If you go back to, um, say, the 70s or the 80s, in the 70s, there were Italian restaurants in the United States. That's, in the 80s, it became, oh, uh, are you Northern Italian or Southern Italian? And then in the last 20 years, 
people have developed the the ability to understand, oh, you're a Sicilian restaurant, you're a Puglian, um, oh, Piemontese. And, and so I believe this process is possible, but it requires much greater exposure and, and acceptance. I don't, I don't think it's a, a willful um, refusal to, to respect German culture. I, I think it's. it's I, I, did not mean, I did not mean to imply that. My dig was far more at the WSET. Uh, <laughs> In their case, so. maybe it is. <laughs> but Eric, for you, you're writing to the consumer, not to the trained professional. Yeah. So when you talk about wines, do you feel like you need to make that distinction for people that let's, let's bring people closer to the heart of German wine by bringing them closer to the regions themselves? Um, I pro probably uh, would not take that approach because I think we're still a couple of steps away from that, talking to a general readership. Okay. We're still trying to get people to, to understand that not all German Rieslings are sweet. Oh, <laughs> um, you know, so it's then it, it, it that's been going on for decades. Yes, it has, and I mean, it's enough and to. It doesn't seem to change. Uh, it seems like there is some very fundamental, inherent resistance to the idea that this thing might be even worth thinking about. Yeah, because it seems to come from the wrong place. But it's, it's just not wrong. Just German reasoning, reasoning, wrong in people's minds. Yeah, and I, I, I honestly think we have, we have to address. Uh, because that's what it is. I'm, I'm sorry. It, it seems so deeply rooted and the resistance seems so very intense. People seem to feel that when you tell them that it might possibly, just possibly, be different, they seem to react in quite an extreme way sometimes. And at the very least, they will brush you off. You have said the wrong thing. Yeah. That was my experience like 10,000 times. Oh my God. Well, I think, uh, forgive me, I, part of, um, you're doing a great job. You've written some wonderful stuff about the wines. You're, you're the other side of the equation, totally. Yeah. I, I, what I meant to say was that part of your, your point, Stuart, was swallowed up by the Zoom gods, and I, I may not have gotten the heart of it, but um, I, I feel in the United States, it's a it's a grape problem rather than a Germany problem. I mean, people feel that Riesling from everywhere is sweet, and maybe that goes back to the you know the big brands of, uh, of Blue Nun and uh, Black Tower and and so on of the mid twentieth century, but um, but there's so much more to offer, and if we set Riesling aside, which is no small thing when you're talking about German wine. Um, you know, to turn people on to uh, Sylvaner and, and Trollinger and uh, Spätburgunder and Weissburgunder, all of these, these wonderful wines that, that generally don't have an issue with sweetness, um, there's just so much there. And, you know, maybe that is a uh, uh, an opportunity to talk about regionalism. Um, for example, I, I have never been, and I've long planned to go to the Württemberg region. Oh, yes. And uh, I very much want to do that. And I think it would be very, it's important for American readers who, who if they know anything about German wines, know, have heard of the Mosul, although they can't pronounce it, in the Rhine. And that's it. Eric, there's, there's, one there's, from Frank. There's, really, there's, there's really a story there because I'm going to Stuttgart tomorrow and that's where um, Mercedes-Benz is based. And the <laughs> some of the best vineyards of Württemberg are literally overlooking the Mercedes-Benz plant in uh, Unterturkheim. And, but that part of town has become the Bronx 
of Stuttgart because that's where the people from the Balkans who are working doing the, the, the badly paid jobs for Mercedes Benz are living. Now, it's an interesting combination I think the international press even began to think about now. Um, shifting focus just a little bit, um, Eric, you have written, and I'm paraphrasing a bit here, that people have complained forever about the daunting label verbiage of German wine, the unfamiliar language, the unique terminology that you write does not always make intuitive sense. But as Paula is fond of saying, German wine is like a board game. The rules are complicated, but once you sit down to play, it all starts to make sense. Uh, is it yes. really... Is it really that much harder to decode German wines than those of other countries? Well, it's it's only hard for people who don't who are not motivated, and that's always a kind of um, dividing line in wine. How motivated are you to learn a small amount that would make your journey easier? I I I. It would be very hard for me to say that uh, Burgundy is simple, um, and yet people seem able to to make that leap if they care. Um, so the question is, how do you make people care enough to make the effort? Yes. So how do you make people care enough to make the effort? Well, then you you have to talk. You talk about the wines themselves, and and. Um, and why they are, are worth it. Uh, and I will say though that, you know, it is a slight disadvantage um, as far as American consumers go to be, um, to be writing labels in the German language rather than Romance languages, which to, to their ears seems more um, harmonious somehow. Yeah. Um, then, then what about Austria? Because Austria seems to have achieved the ability to have some of the regional distinctions, to have some of the understandability that we're searching for with German wine. People seem more committed to you to use your language. They're yeah. they're they're more motivated. Why it's, is that? It's simpler, I believe. I mean, okay. you you learn uh, the name of the grape, Grüner Veltliner, Riesling, um, Laufrankisch. And that's it. You don't have to determine if it's dry or a little bit sweet or a lot sweet or, or, you know, why does it, why does it say mm -hmm. trunk and, and cabinet or, or so on. So it's a little bit simpler, but, but I certainly take your, your point. And I mean, Blau Frankish is a, is I think a good example. It's, it's an amazing wine, and it has all the potential of, of Pinot Noir. It can, it can be uh, complex. It shows great finesse, and yet there's just there's a certain uh, resistance to embracing it. And yeah. I don't know if that has to do with the umlaut or not. But. <laughs> well, I, I think this is a very interesting subject because um, people... Again, I, what I try to do with myself is try and play devil's advocate with myself and think, what would this be like if I didn't speak German? And so um, it is difficult. But I have to say for Austria, yes, there is no stupid predicate system, even though it does exist. And some people make a cabinet, blah, blah, whatever. Um, it is. I, I must honestly say the efforts of the Austrian Wine Marketing Board have far exceeded anything that the Germans have pulled off. And I have to say this very, very frankly, the, the Austrians could teach everyone a lesson when it comes to marketing. Yes. It also, to a degree, is slightly easier to marshal a smaller country than, than a country like Germany, where the, the wine economic dynamics are different, but I draw my hat to Austria and what it has done. There is, and and there's, there's, there's an important difference there. The Austrian wine promotion um, gets government money 
and the German wine promotion, of course, does not. It's funded totally by the growers. Exactly. And so it has to, so, you know, as somebody who works on occasion for the German Wine Marketing Board, for the German Wine Institute, um, they always are beholden to people. And when you go to a foreign country and you do a marketing event, you should only show the very best. And this is where it very often falls down. But hey, I haven't said what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear a thing. <laughs> you know, um, if you look at old New York wine lists from the end of the 19th century, 120 years ago, um, you had Champagne, uh, Bordeaux, Burgundy, Sherry and Port, and Hock. Yes, Hock. And so there was a time when, when German wines were widely accepted here. Absolutely. But those were, those were elite wines, yes. elite estates. Just like, I mean, in a way, this is the story. Every, and, and funnily enough, what is now considered fine wine and what people are very, very happy to spend their money on, what wasn't on those lists, were Italian wines, which I think is a very, very interesting phenomenon. Um, but so you had the um, prime estates of Bordeaux and of Burgundy, and you had the elite estates of Rhein and Mosel. Um, you, would, you would have been hard pushed to find a wine that was from another region. The exception to this was the Liebfraumilch, but that's an exceptional story as it is. Very much so. So, I have one question as we're coming slowly to the end so that you know, I've been watching the chat go through and it looks like there's quite a bit of a, quite a bit, a couple questions that we should probably make sure we leave time for. But I have one question. Um, in job interviews, I always dread the question that comes up. Tell me something about yourself that I wouldn't otherwise know. It's the one where I end up all tongue-tied. Um, so I'm going to be incredibly fresh because it's kind of what I do. And I'm going to ask each of you to conclude our show tonight by sharing one thing that intrigues you about German wine that you believe is not on German wine's resume, but should be. Eric, Anne, whoever <laughs> might have an answer on the end of their tongue, um, feel free to go. I get to sit on this side of the table for once. Um, okay, uh, I, I am proving my point here. <laughs> There's something you need in your life. Today, so far, has been the hottest day in London in 2020. We've had 31 degrees in London. Um, and I needed to be refreshed. And what did I refresh myself with? Sect. Easy to pronounce. The possibility for puns is endless and fun. <laughs> So let's talk about sect, baby. The joy of a sect. Um, and this is super dry Riesling sect. And I've, oh my God, I've drunk a lot of it. So try German bubbles, everyone. Thank you, Anne. That was beautiful. Um, Eric, how about you? Well, um, I might say, uh, given how hot it is in, in New York, equally so, I believe if I translate my uh, Celsius and Fahrenheit correctly. Um, I love Trollinger, a, oh. a light red wine that takes so well to a chill and is exactly the sort of red wine that I like to drink in, in hot weather um, with all kinds of, of foods from, from good, uh, I know the wine, uh, several good producers in Württemberg, and I just adore those wines. And, and I think a lot of America, they're, they're, they should appeal widely because they're very much on point in style right now. Yes, they are, very much so. Fantastic, thank you so much. Those are exactly the kind of things that I think we need to keep getting out there, keep talking about both of the things that you guys have brought up are gonna to be topics on future episodes that we've got coming up. Um, both sect um, and you can turn tune in on July 7th and we've got then the week after on July 13th we've got red wine in Germany um, with a couple of guests as well so Valerie you've been watching the, the questions is there anything that you want to I'll let you take that 
Sure, there are several that are comment questions, um, but David asks, says, and then asks, uh, Chenin Blanc is having a moment now. It also can have gradations of sweetness. How has it more easily cleared the hurdles on which Riesling stumbles and what are the lessons? Either of you care to make the comparison? I, I really think that if Chenin is having a moment, it is down to the fact that you can have it from the Loire and from a huge marketing drive that comes from South Africa. And I think the hurdles are much, much lower because um, Chenin Blanc has got, a, has got a French name. You can have it in various versions. And I think the, the threshold of fear is lower. Yes. Um, that is... <laughs> That is certainly true. And in New York, um, in addition, we have um, a, a brilliant and passionate sommelier and wine authority, Pascaline Lapelquier, who is from the Loire and who is, um, loves Chenin Blanc and has been um, a, an extremely effective and powerful advocate for the, for the beauty of of the wines. And um, I would uh, attribute a great deal of Shannon's moment uh, to her, uh, as well as to the um, interest, growing interest in natural wines and, and wines from the Loire, because there are so many, there's an overlap there. Okay. Um, Joe writes in to say he, he's got a lot of inter interesting insights into writing and selling German wine, but he says, um, is it possible that there's not enough love in the US for German wines because people just don't like them enough? It sounds crazy to us because we know the truth, but maybe the wines are too good. Maybe Riesling especially is too distinctive, too exquisite, too nuanced, too luminous. I agree with that. You know, and I've been pulled up on this. Um, I personally think that Riesling is niche and I love Riesling for its killer acid and we haven't even discussed this sweet thing and acid thing and the interaction of the two. I personally absolutely prefer dry Riesling but I have dear dear friends who love wine who will not accept a glass of Riesling in my house and I respect those people and they are dear to me. And so I know that it's not for everyone. And I have, you know, I have come, being a German girl in the UK, which is not a naturally Riesling friendly place. Um, I have come to the conviction that it is for the niche. And um, yes, to me, it is the greatest white wine grape in the world, but I know that you need to love acid in order to, in order to like it. And not only do I need to like acid, my body needs to like it, which is a different question because if what we're drinking gives you heartburn, then you're never going to fall in love. And this is quite apart from the fact whether you've got the chat, you know, like, um, whether you what, what's in your brain. I've had the opportunity to taste Riesling that just took my socks off. Stuff that is just so thrilling, so sexy that I really, really want to own it and drink it and want it to become part of me. But I know not everybody feels like that. But hey, that for me is a reason to be celebrated because how many people, I don't know, have read this book, what's it called? Fifty Shades of Something, okay? So many, many, many more people have read that book, possibly people who don't usually read, and how many people have read Goethe, okay? <laughs> so to me, the fact that this is a niche interest is actually not a problem. I just think it's something we Germans have to get over. We just have to get over the fact that we're talking, we're talking to a small cult but an interesting cult and 
I can live with that. And that means it'll remain affordable because this is what these wines are, affordable. That, that's even, an even the creme de la creme, the best of the best, I can still afford it as a wine writer. And that's saying something. Yeah. <laughs> Eric, your thoughts on that comment? Um, I, I think it's an excellent point, um, and I understand what uh, I, I agree with Anne. Um, I think in a lot of ways you can say that, uh, make that point about uh, many great wines. They're, they're not entirely understood, and what sells them is uh, status-seeking. And Germany is not uh, in, entirely there yet. So, so for true wine lovers, those wines are still available in a way that, you know, Grand Cru Burgundy is not because mm -hmm. it's simply um, absorbed by, by rich people, mm -hmm. um, ultra rich people, I will say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, in, in a lot of ways, maybe that's a, a better question, not, not how do we widen the audience for, for German wines, but how, how do German wines uh, appeal more in a more focused way toward, to people who can really appreciate them? I think so too. I, I really think that. And it's like, you know, I know, again, I play this game a lot that I, that I play devil's advocate with myself. And there are things that are just not for me, like football, okay? So, or everybody here, like, watches bloody Wimbledon. Would I be bored out of my brains having to watch a ball being passed from, you know, like, it's just not for me, hey. And so I accept that Riesling is not for everyone. I think it's perfectly fine not to like Riesling. That's perfectly fine. And I am not a missionary. I'm a communicator, but I'm not a missionary. And, and everybody who, as a wine writer, assumes this missionary role I think it's like, why do you think you know better than everybody else? I have, a, I have a philosophical problem with a missionary role because I believe if you want to, if, if somebody is interested, they will find the information because the information is there. If they like the wine, you know, like, yes, we can open doors, we can show, but, but missionary work, you know, like, and so much of the wine industry seems to be caught up in thing of how do we educate the consumer how do we well you know like is has there ever been a time before where there has been so much information overload well all we can do and aspire to do is produce quality content and hope that people come to it thank you Anne. that is a beautiful place to end it because that was sort of what prompted valerie and i to start this series to start drink the magazine to start this talk. Um, so I think that is a beautiful way to end it. Thank you so much um, to both of you, to you, Anne, and to you, Eric, um, for coming out, for joining us tonight. Thank you to everybody who came through, who stayed, who listened. It's been fantastic to watch the number grow as the time went on, as opposed to shrinking in terms of <laughs> It, it means we're saying something interesting. Yeah, of course, of course. And, and that's important. Um, so thank you so much. Um, without you all, we're just voices on a screen talking to ourselves. And there's enough of that in the world that we don't need to be a part of it. Um, so this episode, just like all past episodes, will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can listen to the recorded versions if you can't come and join us live. Uh, Shrink Talks episode three will air live on July 7th at 10 p.m. London time, 9 p.m. German time, and 3 p.m. Boston time. Um, and we'll be taking a fresh look at, and drumroll, at Zekt with 
<laughs> with renowned guests uh, Mary Louise Ramland of Zechthaus Ramland and Caroline Deal of Schloss Gut Deal, um, two preeminent uh, Zechthauses here in Germany. We hope you'll tune in and we really look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.